Okay, so thanks to Father Satish for inviting me to be here. And I understand that some of you have read this article that I wrote last March in Commonweal on the Eucharistic Assembly as the Body of Christ. So that's how I got here. So, as he said, Father Satish has asked me to reflect today on being the Body of Christ outside of the Eucharistic Assembly, on thinking and talking and acting like Jesus in ordinary life. Okay, so this, this article in Commonweal begins with the image of a weeble. So do you all know, does everybody know what a weeble is? Weebles are from the 70s. My kids had weebles. They, they wobble, but they don't fall down, right? Okay, so, so I started out with this image of a weeble-like altar server who had to come out and stand in front of the congregation and like try to incense it and the thurible is kind of running away from him. And the congregation is kind of clueless. They don't know whether they're supposed to stand up. And the thurible kind of runs away. And I take this to be an image of the church. It's bigger and messier and less pure than we might expect God's church to be. We are the church with imperfect contrition. Some of you might remember what imperfect contrition is. It means that God's mercy extends even to those who are sorry because they're afraid. I'm going to keep losing my place when I look at you, so this is bad. Anyway, so in this article, I imagined the congregation as a procession of weebles wobbling toward the altar to be fed by Jesus. Outside of the Eucharistic assembly in ordinary life, I still imagine Christians as a bunch of weebles wobbling along together trying to find the kingdom of God. So the title of this reflection on being a disciple of Jesus is weebles wobble but they don't fall down. But actually, sometimes they do. In reflecting on how to be a disciple, how to think and talk and act like Jesus, I couldn't help but think of the example of Pope Francis, who since his election as Bishop of Rome on March 13th, has given the church what my favorite poet calls a shot of love. He has given us an infusion of Jesus juice that we badly needed. Early on, he appointed an international commission of eight cardinal advisors who will meet for the first time in October. Most recently, at the end of August, Pope Francis appointed Archbishop Pietro Parolin as the new Vatican Secretary of State. Parolin had been papal nuncio in Venezuela and some say he had been exiled there, and Pope Francis brought him back. These are exciting decisions that will be crucial for the organizational life of the Catholic Church. But Pope Francis has had a deeper effect, and that's what I want to talk about. Most of us have little knowledge of the politics of the Vatican and its Secretary of State and the Commission of Cardinals. For ordinary Catholics, this has not been an easy time. Just when you hope it might be over, there is another revelation of priestly pedophilia and the cover-up that goes with it. As if this were not enough, we have the four phrases that demographers tell us young people associate with organized religion. The four phrases are scary. They're judgmental, hypocritical, homophobic, and too political. In the face of all this and more, Pope Francis has made it feel good again, or at least better, to be a Catholic. When a reporter asked the newly appointed Secretary of State what he made of the Francis phenomenon, Archbishop Parolin said, what struck me and I consider it a miracle of the election of Pope Francis, is the sudden change of climate 
that was felt immediately. Pauline immediately went on to defend Pope Benedict's efforts at reform, but nevertheless he continued, what struck me is that the perception of the church has been completely changed. From a church under siege with thousands of problems, a church that seemed, let's say, a little sick, we've passed to a church that has opened itself up. Archbishop Paroline is a church insider. Blogger Andrew Sullivan, an ordinary Catholic and former editor of the New Republic, so I guess he's not ordinary, put it this way, what's so striking to me is not what he said, but how he said it, the gentleness, the humor, the transparency. I find myself with tears in my eyes as I watch him. I lived a long time to hear a pope speak like that. Andrew Sullivan is openly gay and he was talking about Pope Francis's widely reported comment on gay priests who do not commit crimes. Who am I to judge? During the past decade, a beleaguered gloom seemed to settle over the church. With the arrival of Pope Francis, it has lifted at least somewhat. Why? How do we account for this change of climate? To put it in the simplest terms that I can think of, Pope Francis reminds me of Jesus. In his inclusively compassionate voice and actions, I hear the voice of Jesus. He calls us back to what the church is supposed to be about, to what we as the body of Christ are supposed to be about. On March 13th, when I first saw the video of this little man standing with his hands folded, this is what he looked like, introducing himself to the people of Rome, as their new bishop and asking them to pray for him. I wasn't sure what to think. And then I heard all these stories. He was riding back to the Casa Marta, the place where the cardinals stayed, on the bus with the other cardinals instead of riding in the papal limousine. He then paid his own hotel bill. He called his landlord back in Buenos Aires to tell him that he wouldn't be back. <laughs> he did. And then he called the Jesuit general on the phone to thank him for his letter of congratulations. And the secretary in the Jesuit generalate wouldn't believe that it was the Pope. They thought it was a prank. <clears throat> he lives in this Casa Marta instead of in the papal rooms because he wants to live with people and he says mass for them every morning. He carried his own bag onto the plane to Brazil and when a reporter asked him about it, he described it as just normal. I thought this was all too good to be true. This guy keeps his own calendar. Like, you know. Can, can he be for real? At the same time, I knew somewhere deep down that for a sacramental people, a radical separation between style and substance wouldn't make much sense. I kept telling the reporters that, that it's not just style. But I wasn't, I wasn't sure. And it would really be too bad indeed if the Pope were just a symbol. So I became a true believer at the beginning of the trip to Brazil when the Pope's motorcade strayed from its appointed course off the reservation, so to speak, and wound up on streets full of Brazilians and no barricades. People surrounded the car. They were like, wanted to touch it. One can only imagine the reactions of the handlers and staff Pope Francis opened the windows and started talking to people and touching them. He couldn't possibly fake this. 
I thought, this is really him. Then I thought, oh my God, somebody's going to shoot him. <laughs> Tell me you haven't thought about that. During the summer, long before the trip to Brazil and World Youth Day, I was having lunch with a friend of mine who does commentary for EWTN. I have lots of friends. He was talking about a piece he did on Pope Francis where he had used the three transcendentals, the true, the good, and the beautiful, to put the last three popes into some perspective. John Paul II emphasized truth. Benedict XVI emphasized beauty. And Francis emphasizes goodness. So this is, what, this is at lunch, so we all said, OK, that's great. But what do you really think about Pope Francis? And this guy is a formal naval officer, a former naval officer. So he says his first thought was that Pope Francis is a security nightmare. <laughs> On the plane back from Brazil, Pope Francis talked explicitly about this minimal security that he has. And he says, then we had problems with security theories. Security here, security there. With less security, I was able to be with the people, to embrace and greet them without armored cars. It's the security of trusting people. It's true that there is always the danger that there is a madman. Alas, yes, there is a madman who does something. But there is also the Lord. But to make an armored space between the bishop and the people is madness, he says. I prefer this madness outside. Closeness does good for all. This is him. That's, that's what he said. OK, so I have three themes. Jesus as the center, accompaniment, and mercy. So these are, and they're all pretty much pastiches of quotes from St. Francis, or Pope Francis. <laughs> <laughs> this inclusively compassionate voice really does remind me of Jesus. But Pope Francis would be the first to say that it's not about him. Christ is the center, he says, not the successor of Peter. The center is Jesus Christ who calls us and sends us forth. If the church makes herself the center, he says, she becomes merely flunked functional, I was going to say functional, and slowly but surely turns into a kind of NGO. Excuse me. The Jesus-like open and compassion of Pope Francis also reminds me, and many other people my age, of John, Pope John XXIII. John XXIII became pope in 1959 when I was a freshman in high school. Addressing his encyclicals to all people of good will, he had a game-changing effect on the church, similar to Pope Francis's. He opened the church's windows, we used to say. He called the Second Vatican Council, which ended when I was a sophomore in college, and really did change the face of Catholicism. We are now embroiled in endless arguments about what it meant and what it means now. Is it a break with the past? Is it continuous with what came before? Could it be a combination of both? Almost two months before he went to Brazil, Pope Francis published his first encyclical, Lumen Fidei, The Light of Faith. He described it to the press as having come from four hands, Pope Benedict's and his. Many commentators dismissed it as an unwanted reminder of a papacy, the end of which they were only too happy to see. My own reading of it is that in the second half of the encyclical, encyclical the voice, say that five times, the voice of Pope Francis comes through clearly. Quotations from the works of St. Augustine are replaced by quotations from the documents of Vatican II. The encyclical's introduction, clearly written by Francis, speaks of Vatican II as a council on faith 
in as much as it asked us to restore the primacy of God and Christ to the center of our lives. If I have learned anything over the past 40 years of teaching theology, it is that whether we emphasize continuity or rupture, we have to admit that the Council's documents and perspective are radically Christological. They are about Jesus. Read the first part of Gaudium et Spes, especially paragraph 22. The Latin titles Lumen Gentium and Dei Verbum do not refer to the church and to scripture. They refer to Jesus. Jesus is the light of nations and the very word of God. It's about Jesus. If he is not the center, we got nothing. In Francis's reading, the council asks us to restore the primacy of God in Christ to the center of our lives. As we know from history, councils like good coffee take time to percolate, to be received and fully integrated into the life of the church. When I read the encyclical, I can't say that, Lumen Fidei, I had the feeling that with Pope Francis, we have entered a new phase in the reception of Vatican II. The hard-won and learned Christocentrism of John Paul II and Benedict XVI remain in place. And from where I stand, that is very, very good. But Pope Francis retrieves for a new time the Jesus-like openness and compassion of Pope John XXIII. Rather than a circle your wagons, draw tight the boundaries, Christocentrism, this is a no-fear Christocentrism that comes with its palms wide open. For Pope Francis, Jesus can't be separated from the church in which we come to know him. In Bergoglio's native Spanish, the Jesuits to which he belongs are the company of Jesus. On the feast of St. Ignatius this past July, he told an assembly of Jesuits in Rome's Jesu Church that the centrality of Christ corresponds also to the centrality of the church. They are like two flames that cannot be separated. I cannot follow Christ except in and with the church. For some in an anti-institutional time of the four words, the four, this will be a hard saying. But Francis gives it his, usually, his usual inclusively compassionate inflection. The boundless love of our Father, he says, also comes to us in Jesus through our brothers and sisters. Faith teaches us to see that every man and woman represents a blessing for me, that the light of God's face shines on me through the faces of my brothers and sisters. Every man and woman is a phrase that recurs throughout the encyclical on faith. It strongly urges that faith in Jesus changes how we look at every man and woman. When Francis says that the Excuse me. When Francis says that the centrality of Christ corresponds to the centrality of the church like two inseparable flames, I take him to mean that clinging mightily to Christ the center is more important than establishing and policing the boundaries of Christ's body. This is the man who as bishop regularly refused dinner invitations because they would make it hard for him to get up for his regular time of prayer, the time when he makes most of his important decisions. When he says that the centrality of Christ and the centrality of the church correspond, I take him to mean that the church's mission and witness in the world are more important than the mechanics of its interior life. The areas about which Pope Francis has expressed concern, for example, what he calls matrimonial ministry, 
the role of women in the church, the synodality of bishops, indicate that any reform of the church's inner life that he initiates will be for the sake of compassion and inclusion rather than as part of some master plan of reform. This is the man who told priests in Buenos Aires who refused baptism to the children of unmarried women that they were guilty of hypocritical neoclericalism. It's one of the best things I heard in years. Accompaniment. In chapter 3 of Mark's Gospel, so many people come and crowd around Jesus that he starts moving toward the sea and he tells the disciples to get a boat ready for him so that the crowds won't crush him. Then, without a transition, he goes up the mountain and summons those whom he wanted, and they came to him. So disciples are the ones who come when Jesus calls. Next, Jesus chooses 12 from among these disciples, and he calls them apostles. And then, and then Mark, Mark says that they might be with him, and he might send them forth to preach and to have authority to drive out demons. So this is why Jesus calls disciples, so that they might be with him and that he might send them out to preach and have the authority to drive out demons. The English that they might be with him is a literal translation of the verb to be in Greek. And so we might also translate it so that they might accompany him. Jesus calls disciples so that they might accompany him, so that they might walk with him on the way. The company of Jesus has already been mentioned. The related word accompany seems to be an important one for Pope Francis. It jumped out at me from the pages of Lumen Fidei. The second paragraph of Francis's introduction sounds the theme of accompaniment, and it refers back to Christ the center. The more Christians immerse themselves in the circle of Christ's light, the more capable they become of understanding and accompanying the path of every man and woman. There's that every man and woman again. It is said that the Jesus-like Pope Francis that we read about and see on TV was not always like that. As Jesuit provincial in Argentina, many said that he was authoritarian. This is a bad thing to be, right? Eventually, the former provincial was sent in something of an exile to a Buenos Aires slum. It was in this slum, in the company of the people who lived there, that Jorge Bergoglio became the man we see as Pope Francis. It is from this slum that Francis's sense of an accompaniment derives its power. Perhaps this is what he meant when he described himself after his election as the man from the end of the world. I was a street priest, Francis said to a journalist who asked him if he felt caged. They actually asked him this on the plane. They said, do you feel caged as the Pope? You know how many times he, he said, I wish to go out on the streets of Rome because in Buenos Aires, I used to go out on the streets. I liked it so much. In this connection, I feel a bit caged. But he was careful not to blame the Vatican police. They are good, 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 bueno, bueno, bueno. I am grateful to them. Though he understands that he can't just go out on the street in Rome, he still wants to. Because he said, my habit was, as we say in Buenos Aires, I was a street priest. In Lumen Fidei, Francis likens God to an accompanying presence. To those who suffer, he writes, God does not provide arguments which explain everything. Rather, his response is that of an accompanying presence, 
a history of goodness which touches every story of suffering and opens up a ray of light. In Christ, God himself wishes to share this path with us and to offer us his gaze so that we might see the light within it. Christ is the one who, having endured suffering, is the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. In Mark 3, the apostles, and we can extend that to us, to contemporary disciples, are called for two reasons that at first glance appear to be at odds. They are called to be with Jesus, to accompany him on the way. And yet, they are also called so that he can send them out to preach the gospel and have power over demons. Pope Francis addressed this paradox in his homily at the final mass in Rio de Janeiro before he left Brazil. When we are sent, Jesus walks with us. Jesus accompanies us, Francis said. He sends us to everyone. Do not be afraid to go and bring Christ into every area of life, to the fringes of society, even to those who seem furthest away, most indifferent. The Lord seeks all. He wants everyone to feel the warmth of his mercy and love. Mercy. Mercy, mercy me. If there is a signature theme to the life of Pope Francis, it is mercy. Mercy is the first word of his Episcopal motto. On the flight back from Rio de Janeiro, an Italian reporter asked a question on divorced and remarried Catholics and the sacraments. He noted that many times during the trip to Brazil, Pope Francis had spoken about mercy. In regard to access to the sacraments for divorced persons who have remarried, is there a possibility that something will change in the discipline of the church? This was the reporter's question. This was a pretty smart reporter. He didn't ask the Pope if he was going to change the doctrine of the church, which reporters are always asking the Pope. Instead, he asked him if there would be a change in the discipline of the church. And Pope Francis gave him a long and involved response. But it began with this simple declaration. Mercy is greater than the case you pose. I believe this is the time of mercy. Then he went on to cite problems such as the bad example of priests, corruption in the church, and clericalism. He really doesn't like clericalism. He says, these have left so many wounds, so many wounds. I'd love to hear him say this in Italian. I, I like he had an Italian grandmother. So many wounds. These wounds must be healed with mercy. Following the example of the Lord who does not tire of forgiving, the church as mother, he says, must go on this path of mercy and find mercy for all. He urged that the church follow the example of the prodigal son's father. When there is someone, not just wait for them, go find them. This is mercy. And then he says, and I believe this is a kairos. This is a time. This time is a kairos of mercy. He pointed to John Paul II's promotion of the divine mercy and the different practice of the Orthodox on divorce and remarriage and made clear that at their first meeting, the commission of cardinals would talk about how to go forward in matrimonial ministry and this problem, the one that the reporter raised, will arise there. While we don't have the discretion to change the discipline of the church regarding the divorced and remarried in the sacraments, the poignancy of this example gives a strong sense of what Francis means by mercy and how it finds a way. Perhaps you have seen the picture 
that was going around on the internet of Pope Francis standing there with a dove on his arm. I don't know if it was real, I, you know, like they doctor up these pictures. So at this point, you might be thinking that this is all too soft and mushy and wonder how we are to distinguish compassion and mercy from crass capitulation to secular standards, say, in issues surrounding marriage. This is complicated by the fact that Western secular standards are most often Christian in origin, but not in consequence. They, they no longer are. And so they have a certain ambivalent affinity to the gospel. My favorite poet has another line. To live outside the law, you must be honest. Rather than on universal standards applied rationalistically in a one-size-fits-all way, perhaps applying universal norms mercifully, it is better to rely on the virtues of good people in conversation with one another to trust in the humility, prudence, and wisdom that we say we admire. One has a sense that Pope Francis might have learned mercy and compassion in his own spiritual life during his providential exile in Buenos Aires. Mercy is the Lord's most powerful message, he says, sounding like he speaks from experience. It is not easy to trust oneself to the mercy of God. But we must do it. From Jesus, we will not hear words of contempt or condemnation, but only words of love, of mercy, that invite us to conversion. Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. The problem, he says, is that we get tired of asking forgiveness. Mercy is a key ingredient in the reconciliation of which Pope Francis speaks often. Divine mercy, rather than some anthropological abstraction, grounds his sense of inclusion. Mercy can even be intergenerational. At World Youth Day in Brazil, he insisted on talking about old people. I thought this was great. And urging that they not be treated as disposable. Let's vote for that. We must never allow the throwaway culture to enter our hearts, he said. No one is disposable. The Madonna of Aparecida, which Francis visited in Brazil, was made by local fishermen from a broken statue of the Blessed Mother that they found. Speaking of the message of this Madonna, the message of restoring what was broken, uniting what had been divided, Francis told the Brazilian bishops, Walls, chasms, differences which still exist today are destined to disappear. The church cannot neglect this lesson, the lesson of the Madonna. She is called to be a means of reconciliation. Listening to Pope Francis, one gets the idea that mercy might even be able to bring about reconciliation between liberals and conservatives. I put those in quotes, in both politics and the church. I know this is asking a lot. On the other hand, perhaps only divine mercy is capable of convincing liberals that their preoccupation with large-scale internal church reform saps energy from the church's mission in the world. And perhaps only divine mercy can convince conservatives that Catholic is not a brand, and that Jesus doesn't need them to police the church's borders to keep out the impure. For Pope Francis, mercy is God's name. God has a particular face, he says. God has a name. God is mercy. God is fidelity. God is life that is given to all of us. Jesus is our peace. 
He is our reconciliation. This is the end. The most important thing we can learn from Pope Francis about being the body of Christ is this. Holy witness based on personal acts of charity and mercy is more effective at promoting both solidarity and evangelization than either liberal reform programs or conservative border patrols. It's about Jesus or nothing. His invitation, Pope Francis says, is open to all without distinction because God's mercy desires all people to be saved. Jesus does not tell the apostles, Francis says, and us, to form an exclusive group, an elite group. We are a church of sinners, and the church is a refuge of sinners. But this should not foster narrow lifestyle enclaves in parishes where you hang around with people that are just like you and nobody else. The realization that we have felt God's mercy should have the effect of opening our hearts wider to the world. Anyone who sets off on the path of doing good to others, says Francis, is already near, is already drawing near to God is already sustained by his help, for it is characteristic of the divine light to brighten our eyes whenever we walk toward the fullness of love. Cardinal Sean O'Malley of Boston is a member of Pope Francis's commission of cardinals that will meet next month in Rome. Last month in San Antonio, he addressed something called the 131st Supreme Convention of the Knights of Columbus. He did a pretty good job of explaining Pope Francis and the change of climate he has brought. Pope Francis, O'Malley told the Knights, is calling on us all to be missionaries in our own communities. We must move from a maintenance mode to a missionary mode. The truth isn't a wet rag you throw in someone's face, he said, but a warm cape you wrap around a person to protect and strengthen them. Our efforts to heal the wounds of society will depend on our capacity to love and to be faithful to our mission. The same Pope who teaches us that the center is Jesus Christ, who calls us and sends us forth, also tells us to never tire of working for a more just world marked by greater solidarity. Jesus is God's accompanying us. As wobbly weebles, we accompany each other as well, every man and woman. We might run into in the ordinary course of our days. In this, we try to imitate what is embodied in the Eucharistic assembly, where we go together to be fed by Christ, and as St. Augustine says, to become what we eat. I have written here, I could end here, but I won't. And then I have three more pages, but I'm going to end here because <laughs> I see people yawning and things like that. So I'm out of here. Thank you.